Hello? All right, can you guys hear me okay? Uh, so I guess I'll just dive right in here. I don't even know what that is, but that's sketchy as fuck. Uh, so my name is Craig Williams. I run the Talus Outreach Team. Um, I've been doing computer security for a bit now. And what I'm here to talk to you today about is ransomware. I know very few of you have seen ransomware or heard of it, so I've got a few intro slides just to cover the topic very quickly. Oh yeah, first off, just to give you an idea of what Talus is. So a lot of people think Talus was like an acquisition that Cisco made. Uh, the reality was Cisco effectively had three separate threat research teams. They had the Ironport SecApps team, the Cisco Track team, and the Sourcefire VRT. Uh, you know, effectively all we did was just shove everybody underneath the Sourcefire VRT's management team. You know, for those of you who've been in the security business for a long time, you know, you've seen layoffs and stuff happen, and that's always unfortunate. But in our case, it really worked out well because each team had its own individual goal, right? The Ironport team obviously was web and email, the Sourcefire team was IPS, and the Cisco track team was just threat oriented. So it really worked out well. We ended up with a giant organization with even more capabilities than ever before. I think right now we're like at 270 researchers and we're hiring in Europe. That's why we're here. Um, give you an idea of how much data we have. We basically have more data than anyone else. Uh, it's how we see things more quickly. And so without that said, I'll just dive right in. So, uh, you know, what's the big deal with ransomware? Why is it such a big threat? You know, think about how much money people made off a compromised user 10 years ago. You know, what was a single account worth, right? Maybe a couple of dollars? And now if I compromise a single machine, it's worth, you know, 300 to $500. If I ransom off an entire hospital's database, it's worth, you know, $20,000. If I ransom off, say, Sony Pictures database, who knows what it would have been worth? Right? And so the reality is ransomware is basically the highest profit margin business right now for bad guys. And as a result, we're not only seeing more people move towards it, we're seeing the adversaries get more and more efficient at it. And that's basically what the talk is about today, to look at what we're seeing, what trends we're seeing, and some of the new things that we're seeing. Um, so like at a really high level, I, I really have to ask this, has anybody here not heard of ransomware? Okay, great. Has anybody here been affected by ransomware or have a direct family member who has? I've got one honest person in the room. So most people have been affected by ransomware connected with somebody. It basically looks like this. You know, you end up doing something stupid, you click on an email attachment, you go to a website, maybe you've turned off your ad blocker. Has anybody noticed the new fancy trends with the, uh, the websites with the ad blockers where they say, hey, you know, because we have a, a dirty ad stream and you're running an ad blocker, you can now no longer view our website. Right, like who's doing that now? Forbes, Wired, all the other websites. Uh, remember when Forbes did it, the very first day they did it, they compromised a researcher? That's the reality we live in. And so this happens to everyone. Even if you have savvy users, it doesn't matter, right? You're going to have somebody who forgets to patch a browser plugin and you're going to get compromised. Uh, so how many people in here thought ransomware was new? How many people in here thought ransomware had been around for the last two or three years alone? So believe it or not, ransomware dates back to 1986. Uh, the very first piece of ransomware was the Age Trojan, uh, written by an absolutely crazy guy. If you want to read a really interesting thing on it, go read his Wikipedia article. Uh, the guy wrote, like, on the side of a bag, like, so-and-so is attempting to murder me, and then tried to go through customs at, like, Heathrow and thought it was going to be okay. He ended up getting arrested and found criminally insane. He didn't get charged. Uh, but it was the very first time it happened. It was a really interesting story. And be believe it or not, his thing was... He tried to, send, to ransom the people on an AIDS mailing list, like literal, the disease AIDS, so that he could donate the money to AIDS research. Yeah, just a weird aside. So back in 1989, that happened. Uh, it was spread by diskette. He actually mailed physical diskettes out to the mailing list and charged about 200 bucks a person. Now here was his problem. Back then, you had to actually physically mail money or do a wire transfer, right? Now what's great about that? Easy, easy to trace, no problem, right? And so it never really caught on. He had this great and innovative idea as a bad guy, but he was, you know, crazy. Uh, and it didn't work out. Now, unfortunately, with the advent of Tor and Bitcoin, we had a unique new phenomena, right? Now we had a way that not only could you deploy your ransomware, but you could control it, and you could also take payment, and it was effectively untraceable. Right? As soon as that happened, that's when we started to see the influx of ransomware and we started to see new people move towards it and people trying out new and innovative techniques to make the ransomware more and more effective. 
I mean, come on, how many people in here have heard of uh, any company on the planet who wrote a crypto library without a bug? Right? Like, <laughs> it, it doesn't happen, right? And so uh, this is where we see adventures in ransomware in the security industry. Uh, so some other examples, right? Uh, you know, these are some of the older ransomwares. Probably everyone's heard of CryptoLocker and CryptoWall. Most people have probably heard of Locky now. So one of the things I wanted to talk about, um, I guess we'll leave this one up. So think about the concept of ransomware for a second, right? Like literally in the physical world, ransomware would be the equivalent of you coming home, your apartment's been emptied, there's a note on the door that said, hey, uh, you know, you go ahead and wire transfer me or, you know, send me like a couple hundred Bitcoin and I'll send you back all your furniture, uh, I promise. You know, it's, it's going to be sometime later, but I'll get around to it, right? Bitcoin wallet ID. Like, no one would fall for that. That's insane. So why do people pay the ransom for ransomware? Does anybody have any ideas? Think about back when this started to happen. You know, what did we see in the papers? Does anybody remember the New York Times article where the, uh, the poor victim hit the Bitcoin exchange on the wrong day and didn't quite have enough Bitcoin, but like the benevolent Robin Hood of the ransomware world went ahead and gave them their files back anyway? Story after story like that, where people got their files back, basically built this sense of trust in CryptoLocker, right? And so what happened was we had these people trusting these ransomwares, basically thinking they were all trustworthy. Now the reality is, if you're in the security industry, you know that's not true. Not only are they not trustworthy intentionally, but a lot of them aren't trustworthy just due to bugs. Uh, and so, regardless, people still pay. So a lot of times we see ransomware on a temporal campaign. This would probably be one of the primary vectors for ransomware right now. Uh, the Windows 10 update campaign went out via email. It actually looked, I mean, it looked pretty fucking bad, but everybody fell for it. <laughs> I'll be honest, right? Like, look at this. You've got UTF-8 encoding errors all over the place. Uh, they misspell Microsoft, like Jesus. And then, <laughs> like, they don't even get the right antivirus. Like, how hard is it to look up Windows Defender? For fuck's sake, it would take two seconds. Um, Lots of mistakes, but anyhow, they throw this ransomware together. Tens of thousands of people fall for this, right? And we're here at Cisco looking over our email corp. It's just like WTF. Like, what are we supposed to do? Um, so if you ran this, you'd immediately be hit with CTB Locker. So now think about this, right? Like with CryptoLocker, how did CryptoLocker build their reputation? Years of paying the ransom, right? So with CTB Locker, well, that's different. Why would I trust it, right? And so CTB Locker has a free sample system, you know, kind of like a drug dealer, I guess. And so if you click on this, this little button, it would list out your files, and it would say, okay, I've got 10,000 of your files. You can have three. Here are the three I've chosen to return to you. And you get those files back, proving the decryption process works. Because that's the reality, right? At Cisco, we've seen countless samples that pretend to be ransomware, but they're not. They just wipe your shit and are like, hey, give us some money. Like, that's, that's where we're headed, right? Think about how much easier that is to write than functional encryption and decryption software. You know, a CS student could write it. Anyone could write it. Uh, but this is how they prove that they're real. Of course, if you load it up, you know, we detect it, blah, blah, blah. This is what ThreatGrid does. Uh, so this is the one I wanted to talk about that I found the most fascinating out of all the ransomware we've looked at all year. So we're stuck with this problem, right? Like, how do you know to trust a piece of ransomware? And what do ransomware authors do about it? And so uh, this particular piece of ransomware, what does it look like? Does anybody recognize this? It looks just like CryptoLocker V2, right? It's visually identical to the GUI. Um, you know, it talks about it being RSA encrypted. Uh, it's a little bit different, turns out. It's the first piece of knockoff ransomware. Uh, it's actually Tesla Crypt. I wanted to show you a demo. Let's hope it works and I don't knock the HDMI cable out since apparently it's kind of iffy. Can you guys see this or do I need a full screen? Can you guys see this or do I need a full screen in? How about you in the back? Can I see hands? Can you see it? Or should I full screen it? Okay, great. Uh, so just to prove, you know, what this is. So here's uh, you know, my valuable data. So my valuable data says PANS earnings are shit, future bookings are down, let's crush them. Um, so my secret plans. Um, since this is my personal VM, I have pictures of my daughter on here, right? Uh, data that's very valuable to me. Like if this got stolen, I might pay for it, right? Uh, there's my kid being a goofball, right? 
and I guess I, should, I better show you both of them so I don't get in trouble. There's my other kid in her Halloween outfit, right? If I lost these, my wife, I, I would be in trouble, especially with as much as I travel. Like, what do you mean you lost all the baby pictures? But let's say I'm not savvy, right? I get one of those emails, one of those temporal emails, and it said, hey, uh, you've been waiting around for Deadpool for a long time. Well, you know what? I've got a cut from the studio. It doesn't have all the special effects in, but it's, you know, the new Deadpool 2. It's awesome. If you install this codec, you can watch it right now. And I'm like, sweet. Click on Run Me, and I'll go watch me some Deadpool. And of course, the first and always thing, benign software doesn't generally delete the installer. Ida Pro is like the only other one. Um, so immediately, this pops up. Now, what jumps out at you? What's unusual about this? So the first thing is the Telltale ransomware screen. Uh, kind of the trifecta is you'll see the ransomware screen pop up, you'll see the ransomware wallpaper pop up, and then you'll see the handy dandy icon on the desktop pop up. Now what's great about this is they actually label it CryptoLocker version 3. That's really abnormal. Most ransomware doesn't go, hi, I'm Bob's ransomware. Uh, and so immediately our detection research team looked into this and we're like, hey, we've taken apart CryptoLocker version 2, 3, and 4. We've got like 80 page white papers on each one, and this doesn't look anything like it. You know, like we did the diff, we looked through the binaries, completely took it apart. There's like no code overlap. It's like 10%, which is like the Microsoft core libraries. And so immediately we're like, literally, this is the first piece of knockoff ransomware. They're impersonating CryptoLocker, right? Why build your reputation as a ransomware author when you can steal it, right? I mean, if you're a thief, steal it, right? Why not? Yeah, and so, uh, you know, let's, let's look here just to prove. So if we look at my, my super secret plans, it's now, you know, high entropy garbage, probably encrypted and not compressed. And we could pop open one of the JPEGs, and if you guys know anything about JPEGs, you'll notice the JPEG header is gone, there's no tags, there's no length values, it's just garbage. And again, high entropy garbage, which probably means it's not compressed, it's blown away or randomized or encrypted. Now naturally, you know, when detection research took this apart, the first thing they looked at was the encryption algorithm, right? CryptoLocker, like most, I don't want to use the word successful, but like most clever ransomware, they don't use symmetric encryption, right? They use asymmetric encryption. Now what's the downside of asymmetric encryption? You know, you have to have a server that it can talk to, to do that exchange, right? So you have to be online. So the Tesla crypt authors probably did agree. I mean, this isn't stupidity, right? They actually have functional symmetric encryption. They're not idiots. But probably due to greed and the want to pop offline boxes, they said, hey, let's make the algorithm symmetric. When the ransomware screen pops up, the user will, they'll pay. They'll plug into the internet and we can get the money. Now, of course, detection research like sees this and they start frothing at the mouth, like, what do you mean they use symmetric? Because what that means is the same key in memory is the key that can be used to decrypt the files. And so uh, Cisco was the first company to release the Tesla Crypt decryptor. <laughs> Thanks, Windows. Go ahead and let me run that. Isn't that great? Like, it lets me run the malware with no warning, but it's like, whoa, Tesla Crypt decryptor, watch out. Um, so it's asking me if I'd like to terminate Tesla Crypt. Like, all right. Then would I like to delete the dropper? I don't know why Manu made that a separate box. <laughs> you know, like, oh, go ahead and decrypt the files, but keep me the sample. Thanks. Uh, then would I like to decrypt the files, sure, and then I want to make a backup, no way, let's, let's live live, right? <laughs> and so uh, what it's doing right now is it's going through memory and extracting the key, and it's going through the drive and looking for every single encrypted file. Now, if you ever played with the first version of this, it was way faster because it only did version one, uh, or sorry, version two. We now support all versions. Now, we'll get to why in a second. So you'll notice now some of my pictures have reappeared. Uh, here's Katie eating her sandwich. Let's see if my secret plans have decrypted. Ooh, they have. Nobody tell anybody about my secret plans. And so I've effectively recovered all my data, and I hadn't paid a single thing. So uh, the reason I showed you that, two reasons. Number one, this is how the security industry wins. When we released this, we were the very first company to release a decryptor for Tesla Crypt. The second we did that, no one had to pay ever again. This post that we did for this file was the most popular blog post Cisco has ever published. It was more popular than the John Chambers executive leadership handover. When you Google Tesla Crypt, I think we're the number one hit still. 
Uh, and so what happened was basically we drew first blood and we pointed out like, hey, while well, these guys can write ransomware, apparently they don't get crypto, right? Like for whatever reason, they're capable of writing good encryption decryption software, but they clearly don't understand encryption algorithms and they're clearly making poor choices. And it was a, pretty much the best thing ever. Uh, immediately when we did that, well, they put out a new version about six to 12 months later and Kapersky, I think, beat us to it. Uh, Kapersky released a decryptor. Kudos to them, you know, fight the good fight. And then six to 12 months later, they released another version. Uh, an independent researcher released another decryption tool. So effectively what we did over a period of about 18 to 24 months was uh, watch them spend shit tons of time and money developing in this ransomware and immediately destroying their ability to profit from it. Right, this is what it's all about. This is what the security industry is about and this is what's important to Talos is that when we do these things, we give back, we release them open source so that people can extend it, other people can add to it, and together we can actually stop the bad guys, right? It's not about taking down one server, it's not about blocking one sample, it's about making it too expensive for the actors to continue their business model. I mean, think about how much money and revenue they spent developing this ransomware, right? That was a significant effort. I mean, think about how much money a company spends developing encryption and decryption software. I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars and we just destroyed that for them. And so that's, that's really what we're all about at Talos, and that's what we enjoy doing. And so I wanted to walk you through Tesla Crypt to show you an example of how the industry wins together. Uh, so with that said, well, what have we looked at as a primary vector so far? Email, right? Everybody knows about email. Uh, probably fewer people know about malvertising. Has anybody in here heard of malvertising before? Okay, about two thirds of the room. So we'll give a quick high level. So malvertising is basically taking advantage of the internet's uh, ad exchange to propagate malware. The advantage with malvertising is that unlike email, the user doesn't necessarily have to do anything stupid. You can be hit by malvertising by simply going to a major news website. Uh, at Cisco, we've been looking at malvertising for years and literally, I'm completely serious when I tell you this, there is no clean ad exchange on the internet. There is not one. There are some that are better. Google, for example, is very good, but it is not completely clean. If you view a website that has ads, you are at risk for malvertising. So to dive right in, uh, you know, a lot of people think the internet ad agencies are all one thing. They're not. They're different companies, they're different components, um, and they all, you know, <laughs> to, to put this in perspective, uh, my vegan tech lead made this slide and I always include it because I like it, the fact that he's a vegan and his hate for the ad agencies are like, eat a cow. Uh, I just enjoy the irony. Uh, but this is what it really looks like. You know, when you go to a website like CNN.com, you're actually connecting to hundreds of sites. Uh, this is a completely benign graph, by the way. This is nothing sneaky. This is the way it's supposed to work. Has anybody heard of uh, Outbrain down here? Does anybody remember the attack the Syrian Electronic Army made against the news websites a few years ago? You remember they hacked a little, little known website called Outbrain, their control panel? So Outbrain is the technology that says, hey, you've read this article. Would you like to read this other article? Now luckily for us, the Syrian Electronic Army was only using it to push propaganda, but they easily could have used it to push malvertising. And so it's things like that that attackers take advantage of. Uh, and we're talking anything from like compromising one of these servers to paying for a legitimate ad and having a redirect embedded in the ad. You know, anything and everything. So to simplify it a little bit, this is basically what it looks like. You'll have a user go to the website. Uh, the website will redirect you to an ad server and that ad server may direct you to a benign ad, right? That's a great day. You went to a website, you saw the website, you saw your ad, they got one one thousandth of a penny, everybody wins, right? Now unfortunately, some days it doesn't work like that. Some days you go to the website, you get redirected to the ad server, you go to a partner, and that partner unfortunately links you to a server that's got a malicious link on it, and then you go to an exploit kit landing page. This is probably the highest risk to users on the internet that we can see. Uh, right now, we're seeing uh, about 20 billion threats a day blocked, and malvertising is by far number one. Uh, so let me give you a real world example of this. Uh, we're gonna talk about the Angular exploit kit. Has anybody in here heard of the Angular exploit kit before? It's about half. So the Angular exploit kit is about the highest profit exploit kit we've ever seen. Uh, it caught our attention in, I guess it would be like 2014. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, probably the most well-known exploit kit was uh, Paunch's exploit kit. 
you know, the black hole exploit kit was very well known and widespread and it was used worldwide. Uh, what happened was basically it was too famous for its own good, right? When everyone's using this exploit kit and it's making, you know, tens of thousands of dollars every week, of course it pops up as number one on law enforcement's radar. And so international law enforcement came together and said enough's enough and they all decided to get together and go after this guy. Uh, they got him. He was actually finally sentenced a couple months ago to several years in prison. He'd sat in prison for years awaiting sentencing. And so the problem was, at the time, people thought that was great, right? It sounds great, like catch the bad guy, put him away. But what happens when you have a demand that's hundreds of thousands of dollars and all of a sudden the supply goes down overnight? Do you think people just say, hey, I don't want to make that money. Let's leave it on the table. Uh, so immediately overnight, we saw dozens of new exploit kits surface. Uh, things like nuclear, neutrino, angler, all vying to be that number one. And so, you know, we watched it for a little bit. And I, I think in the annual security report last year, we basically declared angler the winner of the exploit kit arms race. It was able to not only out-innovate the competition, but when other people had a great idea, they would steal that idea and incorporate it as their own. You know, and, you know like malware and uh, like we saw with Tesla Crypt, there's no honor among thieves. There's no patents for good ideas for malware. You know, if they think of it, they'll move to it. And to give you a solid example of that would be uh, when the Fiesta exploit kit used Silverlight as an attack vector for the first time. Until that point, no exploit kit had ever used Silverlight as an attack vector. Well, immediately the Angler authors saw that and were like, wow, they basically found an antivirus bypass. I think we'll use that too. And so they started using it within a couple of days. Uh, so we started looking at Angler, and we uh, took a look at uh, Limestone Networks in Dallas, Texas, because it's geographically close to where my team resides, and it was hosting, you know, slightly over 50%. Now you'll notice uh, Hetzner in Germany was around 50%. We had some smaller spikes. Until about December of last year, Angler was very, very tightly controlled. Uh, as around January of this year, it got a little bit looser and then went dark, and we'll talk about that in a second. But to give you an idea of why this one was so interesting, um, has anybody not heard of VirusTotal? So VirusTotal is basically the antivirus clearinghouse for the industry. Uh, it was a company called Hispec Systems that Google bought like in 2008 or 9. Um, effectively, every antivirus company in the industry uses it. When you upload a file, uh, it'll get scanned by, I think it's like 40 or 50 antivirus engines, and it'll tell you what they detected it as. It's a really cool tool. Uh, unfortunately, when you upload Angular samples, Virus total doesn't detect it. Uh, we had a detection rate of 6%, and uh, of that 6%, most were detected by less than 10 engines, which, you know, when there's 40 or 50 engines, it's, it's an appallingly low rate. And the reason it was so low was because the samples are encrypted, right? Uh, if you've ever written, like, IPS signatures or claim AV signatures, you know you need something to tag on. Well, if it's been encrypted, it's going to look like super high entropy data, and there's simply nothing there. And so that's the reason it was so hard to detect. Uh, from a network perspective, it also had several evasions. They had things like dynamic DNS, uh, domain shadowing that made it hard to detect. If you've never heard of domain shadowing, effectively what it is, it's a technique of registering tens of thousands of subdomains using uh, what we believe is fish credentials for domain registrar. And so, you know, they're basically hijacking the reputation of the base registrar's domain uh, and just, you know, having like a 26 character randomized subdomain. And they rotate through tens of thousands of those every few minutes. Anybody want to guess why that's a problem? Just think about how simplistic web blocking technology works. You know, does a lot of the really, really cheaper stuff use multiple detection engines? No, they just use a whitelist and a blacklist. Well, if you use a whitelist and a blacklist, you can't easily rotate in and out tens of thousands of entries every two to five minutes. You just overload the device. Uh, they also used, you know, adversary owned everything. So to give you an idea how this worked, this is a real example. Uh, they targeted things like this pretty frequently. This is the Fergus Falls Journal. Uh, if you went to the Fergus Falls Journals and you were unfortunate enough to go to the obituary section, you'd be redirected to Sense and Sensibility, which would quickly redirect you to an exploit kit landing page, usually dropping uh, CryptoLocker version 3. Does anybody realize how fucked up this is? Like, why do you think they're targeting obituary pages? What age group could they be targeting that use Internet Explorer and don't patch ever, right? They're targeting your parents. They're targeting my parents, right? These people have thought this through. This isn't careless. 
This is very precise. Every piece of angler is very carefully designed to not only compromise that specific age group and that group of users, but to do so in a way that's very difficult to trace. Uh, so to give you an idea of what they targeted, uh, they do still, well they did still target a little bit of Silverlight, but primarily Flash and Internet Explorer. If you didn't use Internet Explorer, you didn't have to worry about Angler. But the thing was, if you saw the malvertisement and you were not running IE or you were not vulnerable, you would never see the exploit. So your antivirus engine would never say, hey, that site's bad and report it. You'd simply never know it was there. And the way that they did that was through a very, very careful and deliberate architecture. So when you went from the Fergus Falls Journal, you would be redirected to what we called the proxy server, which is effectively Limestone Networks. Now, I want to be clear here, Limestone Networks was a victim in this. Uh, these accounts that were, that were made for the hosting the, the boxes were all fraudulent. They would come in overnight, they would make up some identities, they would use stolen credit cards, and they would get hundreds of machines. And these weren't done in a row, they were scattered out very cleverly, so that they were very difficult to detect. And so for Limestone, not only are they losing time and, you know, racking the boxes, powering the boxes, but they're also getting hit with tens of thousands of dollars of chargebacks. Right, as soon as the credit card company comes back and says, hey, these are stolen. Uh, so Limestone is very helpful. Um, the proxy server would then you know, direct the user over to the exploit kit server, almost always in the Netherlands, over port 81 using SSL. Anybody know why they like the Netherlands? It's the same reason the Pirate Bay likes the Netherlands, right? They have very, very strict data privacy laws. You can't just go say, hey, that box is evil, you should take it down. That doesn't work. Um, if the exploit kit server interrogated the browser and found out that they were vulnerable, it would then send down an exploit over port 81, encrypted, to the proxy server, which would then feed it to the user exploiting them. To the user, it of course would look like Limestone Networks was attacking them. And so if the user reported it and said, hey, this box is hosting malware, well, Limestone Networks would say, oh, thanks for telling us, we'll unrack it immediately. Unfortunately, there's a health monitoring server Every 60 seconds, the health monitoring server is pinging the proxy server, saying, are you up? The second it's down, you know, just like cutting the head off a of Hydra, it would rotate in a new one, which would then take over, and so you'd have an effective downtime of 30 seconds for taking down a server. That's intelligent architecture. Uh, it would also gather logs from the exploit kit server and wipe them every 24 hours. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to why they would do that? You know, what's an IE exploit worth? Right? These people buy O'Day, they use O'Day. If they're not having success with their exploits, well, they're going to go take their money and they're going to go invest in a new exploit. Maybe they need an O'Day, maybe they don't. But if they're having stuff that doesn't work, they've got to at least rotate. And of course, you know, the entire time, there's yet another server, the master server, which is of course fetching the logs from all the status servers. Keep in mind, this is a collapsed 3D model. There are hundreds of these, hundreds of these, dozens of these, and dozens of these. Massive, massive network. So, of course, we partnered with our good buddies at Level 3. They're the group that helped us with SSH psychos and some other research. Um, this is what it actually looked like. So this is the actual health check. Uh, notice they're using the URL as a password. Uh, you know, nice randomized string. If you didn't know that string, of course, you wouldn't be able to get the health check. But if you knew it, it would return 204, and you'd know immediately, oh, 204, okay, that means you're up and running and ready to pwn users. Um, had another password down here to get the log files. That would allow you to not only fetch the log files, but call delete on the log files, effectively covering your tracks. And over here is a nice, helpful redirection. Um, <laughs> this one is to WorldStream in the Netherlands. WorldStream's really funny. I called WorldStream and said, hey, you know, you're hosting the Angular exploit kit. You're compromising our users. I blocked you from Cisco customers, but you really need to take down that box. And they're like, okay, well, you know, Dutch privacy laws. Let me look into it and I'll call you back. So the next day they called me and they said, hey, I just wanted to let you know we were able to contact the owner of that machine and they assured us that yeah, you were right, it was compromised, but they've actually resolved the issue and it's fine. Meanwhile, we're watching them continue to redirect users to the exploit kit landing pages. Uh, so it's a problem with dealing with uh, these different servers in different countries. Now, I forgot to mention, uh, this part was in the Netherlands, this part was usually in Russia or the Ukraine. Uh, proxy servers were almost always in the United States. Anybody want to guess why that is? Makes it hard for law enforcement. Right? They're intentionally spreading it out to make it more difficult. 
So uh, because we had all these log files and because we had all the data on it, for the first time ever we were actually able to calculate out if you know the exploit kit continues to operate in the manner that we've observed it, how much money are they making just from ransomware? And so uh, from a single proxy at Limestone, they would get 90,000 victims a day. Of those 90,000 victims, 10% would be served an exploit. Of that 10%, 40% would be compromised. 60% wouldn't. Maybe due to it being like a heave spray and it wasn't reliable, maybe they had antivirus, maybe it was just, you know, a bad day, who knows. Uh, of that 40%, 62% were delivered ransomware. So 38% were delivered different malware. Uh, more often than not, Bedept, uh, which is a click fraud type malware that we believe the Angular authors also wrote, but that's another talk. So just from the ransomware payload, uh, if you use the FTC's estimate of 2.9% of people pay the ransom, uh, we lowballed the price of Bitcoin to $300. Uh, it was around 500. I think it collapsed a little bit though when the last major Bitcoin thing crashed. Uh, and the number of redirection servers we saw, they're making approximately $34 million off of ransomware just from the limestone networks portion. Now if you remember back at the beginning, I showed you there was almost an equal portion of Hetzner so conservatively, about $60 million from ransomware. Uh, remember, there's 38% at each server that's click fraud, BDEP most likely. So they're making significantly higher than $60 million a year just off ransomware from this one exploit kit. This is the problem we face. So uh, we dug into it a little bit further. Uh, how many people in here have ever heard the statement that ransomware does not affect Russian language users? Yeah, it's a common fact that's really not common. Uh, if you've read up any on our white papers, they actually use undocumented Windows APIs to determine this. Um, and so, you know, when we were doing this research, we were able to tie a lot of stuff together. So, you know, I mentioned um, BDEP earlier. Well, this is some of the hosting history. And so we were able to tie the hosting history of BDEP to the hosting of Angular. Uh, and, oh yeah, I forgot the important one. And the, uh, the Lurk Trojan. best clicker ever. Uh, and so what happened was there was a Trojan called the Lurk Banking Trojan. And unlike most stuff, it actually focused on Russian and Ukrainian banks. Uh, turns out that was not the best idea for them. Um, effectively what happened was the people behind the, uh, the Lurk Banking Trojan were suddenly arrested. Well, it's funny. The second they were arrested, um, several botnets disappeared, including Angular. Uh, Drydex and Locky largely disappeared. Now this isn't to say that Angular's gone. You know, I want to make that very clear. Uh, we're talking about something that's worth, you know, well over a hundred million dollars a year potentially if you include all its profit margins. It's going to come back. Somebody has that source code. Uh, it's just a matter of when. But it's great to think that right now it's actually dead due to their carelessness. Uh, now I wanted to talk to you real quick about the brand newest stuff we're seeing. Um, has anyone in here heard of the Sam Sam ransomware? So, okay, not many people, that's surprising. So, uh, up until now, all ransomware required a user to propagate, right? Like we saw with the temporal-based ransomware where they would take advantage of something like the Windows 10 update, or they would take advantage of something like a movie, or the Chilean earthquakes, or the Ecuador earthquakes, or whatever, you know, it required a person to click on that email attachment. Like malvertising, right? It required a person to go to a website. Right? It, they didn't have to make a mistake necessarily, but they had to go to a website with an unpatched browser and they could be compromised. Uh, with SamSam, -Sam, they actually changed that model. Um, now what's interesting about this is SamSam -Sam had the clever idea of using network vectors and a ransomware payload. It was actually not that advanced. SamSam -Sam used off-the-shelf JexBoss. Uh, it's a pen testing toolkit for JBoss servers with a, a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old CVE. Who has a nine-year-old web server facing the internet that hasn't been patched? That's terrifying. But it turns out millions and millions of people. Uh, and so what happened was Sam Sam basically would scan the internet looking for these nine and seven-year-old CVEs and it would then attack them. And it would use JexBoss to install a backdoor. Um, once that backdoor was installed, they would poke around for some unknown period of time and then install ransomware on various boxes on the network. Now what was interesting about this is throughout the entire ordeal, they had a lot of really weird behaviors. So not only were they using off-the-shelf 
uh, payloads and back doors, which is really weird, right? Because that makes it easy to detect. But so they were doing things like this, where they were selling like bundles of keys. That's really weird. Up until now, every piece of ransomware has been like, you pay X dollars for a computer. Well, Sam Sam decided to go for like the Costco bundle model. I don't know if that works over here. Is there like a Costco here? You get, you're gonna help me out or just shake your beard? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So like basically they're saying, if you buy all your keys at once, I'll sell you 20 keys for the price of 15. That's bizarre as hell, right? Like somebody who runs a network that has valuable data, they don't want seven eighths of their data. They need all their data. They would pay for all their data. It's just weird because uh, they're not targeting people without deep pockets. They're targeting, you know, mostly hospitals in America and Europe. Uh, so that was weird. The other thing that we noticed was that as the ransom went on, they increased the demand from one Bitcoin to one and a half Bitcoin per machine, and then to three Bitcoin per machine. I think the Washington Post even had somebody saying four per machine. So, you know, they're t potentially losing four Bitcoin per machine times several machines per bundle. That's thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. That's really weird for a ransomware author to leave that amount of money on the table. So what this led us to conclude is that basically they had no idea what this data was worth. Like, they had no idea. Uh, personally, I think they were completely new to this, right? They didn't write their own payload. They didn't write their own backdoor. They don't have any idea what they're doing from a monetary perspective. It's just mistake after mistake after mistake. Um, so what's interesting about this is that, regardless, it was incredibly effective. They didn't need a person, right? They could scan the internet. They could find these vulnerable machines and install these backdoors. And then at their leisure, go back through and say, hey, is this network worth ransoming? And so the first time we saw this was in uh, December of 2015, targeting the gaming industry in the United States. And it was a very, very limited attack, right? A very, very small number of victims. Uh, in early 2016, we saw it explode. And for whatever reason, the attackers targeted the US healthcare industry. Now, I think this may have been like a psychological twist, right? Like if you target one you know, vector or one vertical all at once, well, everyone in that vertical can kind of come forward, and it's not that bad. It's super hackers, right? No one can defend against super hackers, despite the fact that they're using a 10-year-old vulnerability. Uh, what, to make matters worse, and what really bugged me about this, was every single victim was like, uh, we've never been breached before. This is the first time this has ever happened, and I can assure you that no data has leaked out. We saw those press releases time and time again. Does anybody think that kind of thing is true when you have a 10-year-old vulnerability? Not very likely. Obviously, I can't state anything solid one way or the other. But uh, of course, you know, being in Talos and with our mission as on our poster of pissing off the bad guys, which, sorry, I'm now supposed to say uh, forcing bad guys to innovate. Um, we worked with Cisco IR, and uh, Cisco IR had a customer who came forward and said, hey, I've heard of these Talos guys. Please share our data with them so that they can do something to help us. And we had an incredible discovery. It turned out that the authors behind Sam Sam would take up to 74 days to actually install the ransomware. Yeah, it's insane. And so immediately we're like, wait, we have 74 days to like save the victims? You know, <laughs> badass, fire up the scanners. And so uh, we started scanning the entire internet. Uh, we found approximately 3.2 million vulnerable servers running on normal web ports. Uh, so these are 3.2 million servers that are running nine-year-old web server code and seven-year-old web server code. These are not unimportant businesses. These are embassies, aerospace engineering companies, schools, hospitals. These are businesses that you would expect to have better security postures. The problem with this is, uh, I don't want to digress too much, but if you watch Rob Joyce's talk from Usenix, uh, where he talks about how the NSA targets companies, the entire point of his talk is the way that the NSA is so successful is that they know the network better than the customer knows it. This is exactly how Sam Sam worked. They knew they found 10-year-old servers pointed at the internet that the victim had no idea was there. And so they then would compromise that server and use it to move laterally for like 70 days. Um, so of course, we decided that's not gonna happen. We wanna literally take the money out of the bad guy's pocket. And so uh, we looked for servers that were already backdoored. Because again, Jack's boss is an off-the-shelf payload. It's super easy to fingerprint. And so on port 80, we found over 2,173. Uh, 2 uh, we then, of course, were like, oh, wait, what if people ran on non-standard ports? And we found another 1,600. 
Um, and so we basically took, I don't know, half of my team, half of our interdiction team, and said, hey, here's thousands of IPs. Find someone for every single one and fix it. And so for about three weeks, we did that. And we literally took thousands of dollars out of the authors of Sam Sam's hands. Uh, now, this was the bigger problem. As we started working with these victims, we found out that for the first time ever, it wasn't getting one actor off a machine. Uh, the average number of actors on these machines were four. Uh, there was one box that had over 180 actors on it. And keep in mind, all over the news we'd been hearing, this has never happened before. All your data is safe. You know, I, obviously, we don't know one way or the other, uh, but we do know that uh, it was incredibly disturbing. Uh, there was an unbelievable amount of elementary school software that was targeted. It's possible they were the next vertical, uh, so we worked with Fallout. They'd actually developed the patch prior to us scanning, and we're in the middle of deploying it, so it was really advantageous for everybody involved. Uh, but again, you know, my point here is that this wasn't Super Hacker. This was some dude who just had an idea and decided, why don't I take a well-known network vector off the shelf out of a tool similar to something like Metasploit and just add a ransomware payload. Anybody could have done this, and this was incredibly effective. And the problem now is that the author has tens of thousands of dollars, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, from all the hospitals that they hit. And so when they come back, they're going to actually have the funding to have hired proper developers, similar to the authors behind Angular. And so I think it's something that the security industry as a whole needs to keep an eye on. And I know we definitely are. Uh, so that's all I have to talk about today. If you guys want to follow along, you can go to our website. It's got all our white papers. I've given you like the 90 second overview of like the 80 page white paper. Uh, we announce all our stuff on our Twitter. Any questions, comments? All right, well, thanks for your time.